Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our webinar sponsored by Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lair on the topic of can the right construction technology increase profitability and improve project management. Along with our expert panelists, we will discuss topics focused on utilizing ever-changing technology to improve efficiency and profitability and safety in today's construction industry. My name is Jim Rolfing and I'm a partner in Saul Ewing, Arnstein and Lair's construction and real estate practice groups out of our Chicago office. I'm joined today by my partner, Louis Archambault from our Miami office. Lewis is vice chair of the firm's real estate practice. I would like to now introduce our panel of experts. Uh, Matthew Abels is the vice president of construction technology and innovation for the Associated Builders and Contractors, which is a construction association with 22,000 member companies across 69 chapters throughout the United States. Matt provides resources and education to help his member companies use technology to be safer, more profitable, and to win more work. In other words, he's helping people implement technology on the ground level, if you will. Elizabeth Mausch is a senior principal and on the board of directors at the esteemed engineering firm of Thornton Tomasetti. Elizabeth leads the forensic practice for Thornton Tomasetti. She's advancing new construction technology in forensic investigations and leading the uh, Thornton Tomasetti's R&D in-house practice. Uh, our third panelist is James Robert Scott, who is a research scientist, lecturer, and the director of Real Estate Technology Initiative at MIT's Center for Real Estate, with a primary focus on real estate automation and technology. James combines a background in commercial real estate with a unique understanding of real estate technology to identify the products and the processes that are gonna provide future spaces in which people will want to live and work. I can't tell you how excited I am about these three folks, all of whom are, I think you're gonna find brilliant and have a lot to say. Uh, got a couple little housekeeping announcements before we start. Uh, please, I encourage you to submit questions through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we're gonna uh, do our best to answer questions. If we don't answer them in the middle of the, the webinar, we're gonna reserve a little bit of time at the end. And if we don't get to them at the end, we're gonna to try to follow up with you individually uh, by email. Following the webinar, you will receive an email that will include links to the webinar recording. Uh, finally, the legal disclaimer. What would a legal webinar be without that? The provision and receipt of the information in this program is not legal advice, does not create a lawyer-client relationship, and should not be acted on without seeking professional counsel who have been informed of the specific facts. Okay, let's get this going here. Um, so thanks again, panelists. I really appreciate y'all being here. Uh, the first question I wanna throw out is um, to keep us topical, has there been uh, an acceleration of the adoption of construction technology in this post-COVID era? And what, if any, long-term effects will or has the pandemic had on construction technology? I, I, can, I can start by just giving a quick anecdote of, of just some data we found. Um, so at ABC, I think there's this aura out there that technology is just for the big contractors, but something we found, and this was from data from last year, um, which you know coincided with the pandemic and the pandemic taking place the year prior, is that 
um, 267 of our best projects across the country, of which 80% of those are less than $50 million projects. Those projects, which are the rated and nominated the best across the country, 93% of them were using some sort of technology, that being project management, drones, robotics. So you are seeing not just the big contractors using tech, but the small and mid-sized um, contractors on small and mid-sized projects also using technology in a way we haven't seen in a long, in quite some time. James, you think that's been changed by the pandemic at all? Um, I think the pandemic has had a huge influence over the last two years on the construction industry in, in a number of ways in that it has opened so many more people's eyes up to what technology can do. Um, as, as Matt alluded to, you know, like, I mean, you know, he's talked about the big companies. The big companies have been looking at technology for a lot, for, for you know, a significant amount of time, and they put a huge amount of investment into it. And I think what the pandemic did was it really facilitated construction technology as our, our contact or whatever way you want to describe it to be immersed within the masses. And so people started because, I, and that was, of course, I had born at what's the old expression? Um, necessity is the mother of invention. Because people were off site, because people were not necessarily, you know, been, been able to be on site or to be able to had to work remotely, they needed to look at what was actually available out there, what had worked in the past, and you know, could they implement it into their own specific uh, group or their own specific team? And you know, now, I mean, I'm talking to guys on my street. I mean, I, I live in a very kind of you know, suburban part of, of Boston, and I've, I'm talking to guys who my street are doing kind of renovations and, and they they're all tech savvy now they're all like I mean, they have they've all got ipads in their hands and it's a it's a long way from the the guys you know the, the four or five guys pulling up in in, in a pickup truck you know, with, with a bag of tools like it kind of it's it's kind of really impressive what's taken place over the last couple of years so um i want to ask a related question and i know you've got an opinion on this elizabeth so if you don't mind i'm going to ask you to jump in first um I would say that the consensus opinion in the construction industry and, and maybe outside of it about the industry is that the industry has been slow to adopt technology in its practice. Do you agree with that statement? Um, and if so, why is that the case? And uh, you know, why can't construction be like manufacturing? So, so first, I think there was an article in The Economist that said that construction was the least innovative of all the industries. Um, and as an idea, that's ridiculous, right? I look outside my window, I'm sitting in New York City and I can look out at all the new buildings that have been built. So technology, like how strong concrete is, how it pours, how um, the codes have been evolving, how we design, how we construct, right? The, the way the cranes work, uh, the details of how we build has been innovating and changing. And what we do today is different than what we do yesterday. And what we do with tech, right? Technology, um, that is things that can be done on an iPad, not just you know, the science behind what we build. That's taken a little longer. And some of it's because, you know, you're not, when I put a design on paper, I'm not the one that builds it. So in between, I've got to communicate that design to somebody else and that person's got to um, construct it. And in fact, the person building it should really be good at building it. It doesn't necessarily need to be good at, at um, you know, using the iPad or tool or whatever. So it's, it's been interesting so to your previous question about COVID, it's made everybody, everybody better at the tools, right? It's, it's reduced the digital divide, which we see in the construction industry from between laborers and, and, and developers, right? Somewhere in there are folks that have a lot of access to tech they can play with to people who have less, right? Like at home and the rest. Um, but COVID pushed the line for that um, somewhere else and more people like us get together on video, which would have been ridiculous um, in 2019. Um, so <laughs> the industry has always been innovating, but I look forward to what we're gonna do now that we have even more new, to new tools. Well, I think the, I'm sure, you know, you, you've seen that, that's the scale that McKinsey wrote, you know, has that says uh, construction is right, right above agriculture and hunting as far as how innovative we are. I've always said, if I do my job right, by the time I retire, we should be not just the second largest industry, but the second most innovative. And we're actually seeing us making progress there. But 
Um, we, we've been innovating for a while and I think it's not just technology. That's why my, so my job title is not just technology, it's technology and innovation. And especially when you look at the way of uh, Elizabeth, you see, you see this all the time in New York uh, where we're going with prefab. Mm. Well, I might just jump in on this a little bit. To be fair to the construction industry, while it might, you know, it, I've seen those, those statistics before of, of not being, you know, anywhere near the level of innovation. It is restricted in certain ways as well. When you look at the margins that most construction companies work off and then what they have, you know what I mean, to be able to set aside for R&D, they're a long way from the Amazons or the Facebooks of this world where they can just, you know, throw money at things. It's also a cyclical business, you know what I mean? You know, and a lot of these guys are, and girls are, you know, they've gone through a number of recessions. So you can understand they're, they're risk averse. And then when you do talk to some of the kind of more, we'll call them the more innovative construction players out in the world, and we work with a number of them here, you know, here at the center. They, you know, how will they put this? They've, they've often been burnt as well because there's so many different products out there and there's so many different systems out there. It can be very, very hard to navigate. And over the course of, you know what I mean? Even when you decide to go out there and innovate and you spend a little bit of money here and there, some of the systems work, some of them don't, some of them, you know, so, and that can be for any number of reasons. It's not necessarily because the, const- the technology doesn't work. It could be because the CEO of, of another company is just better at marketing the, a, a particular system. You know what I mean? That, that adoption of what a technology or, or a product is can come from so many different facets. So as an industry, I always, I, you know, I know construction gets given out to because of those two statistics that you just you kind of named, but I, I do understand where that kind of stems from a little bit as well and why there is that kind of, kind of just kind of, let's, let's take a wait and see approach from a lot, an awful lot of construction companies out there. And the technology's gotten cheaper too. It's, it's okay. not as expensive as it used to be, which is why you had, like you said, a lot of the big companies using it. Now, as the technology's gotten cheaper, it's gotten more available. And now the bigger problem is it's coming so fast that speed of innovation requires clarity, which is one of the, you know, that's one of the things that a lot of the small mid-sized guys are trying to figure out. They're being called about tech companies all the time. They're not clear on what's going to help them, but there is opportunity that didn't exist five years ago for them. You've touched on something really interesting there. They're getting called up by all these tech companies all the time. Most of the people in the construction industry don't have a very, you know, have a very kind of strong technological background. So they're not entirely sure with what they're dealing with as well. There's that little, you know, and I'm not saying that they have a lack of skills. They, you know, there's some of these guys who are some of the best businessmen in the world. But, you know, when you mention technology, they can be a little bit, hold on here, you know, is this something that I can excel at? Am I a little bit dubious towards it? And that, that definitely happens an awful lot of the time, especially when it comes to adopting new tech. They're not, this isn't necessarily their wheelhouse. And when you have, you know, 20 to 30 sales rep bringing you on a kind of, you know, monthly basis or even maybe even more, you know, you, you hear all of these terms, a lot of them you're unfamiliar with, it can be an awful lot to process. So how do you, you know, how do you facilitate that adoption without really implementing it and actually, you know, laying money down on the table? It's a very hard thing to do sometimes. Uh, I'd still want to separate technology from innovation, right? Because the way that we do, that is anything is constructed has been changing. And the group of folks, you know, regardless of size of company, have been improving how they do their work for the same reasons, to make it more efficient, to, to build more, right? There's a shortage of housing. There's always, it always feels like there's a construction shortage, right? So many issues to address that are really important. And um and the tech piece of it, I think that part of the where the, the linguistic thing hits me is that, you know, for the construction industry, it really has to work. You can't just say that, you know, this idea is cool or it lets people talk together. It has to have an implementation. It actually has to do something. And I think the same folks that get called for tech, they get called by rug suppliers and, and faucet suppliers and everybody else, right? Because they're the connection points between a, a billion dollar industry and something to sell. Um, but uh, it, it is it is changing. And it, I think much like a like finite element, the code that you use to make airplanes fly faster was developed in order to design buildings. So there's gonna be stuff that we figure out. Um, so this set of technology that we're using now in con- construction that at some point will make its way back and the other guys will be like, wow, this is reliable. And it, I do think it's both technology and innovation differently that have to help support. We we have the last number I saw is 630,000 jobs that we need to fill in construction. It's both those pieces that are going to help fill that gap. 
and, and there's probably a big difference between uh, Thornton Tomasetti's technological savvy and the technological savvy of a small electrical contractor, right? So we get to see everything, right? There's sometimes, I like to joke, I'm the engineer of record of offense more often than anything else. Um, so whether or not somebody is using a computer, right? That's one definition of technology and more people are using computers to input information right away, not writing it on a sheet of paper. And that makes a huge difference from, for what you can do with that data later. Um, so that's one big important category. And that's, I think, kind of our focus when we talk about construction technologies, what one can do with ones and zeros. Um, but no, that MEP contractor is using different materials now than they were using not that long ago. So the innovation is still there. Um, it's just, you know, you live in it, you get used to it, you take it for granted. Well, and Elizabeth, you guys, and I think you still have Thorn Tom said actually invests or you have an arm that invests in technology too, on top of it. Um, so I think it's interesting that you guys not only see that stuff, you guys double down and you get, uh, you have an opportunity to actually be a stakeholder in some of it. And as I don't know, I think the last number was 30, $35 billion going to construction tech, you guys have played a part in that. But I think it's interesting because you're not alone in builders who are investing in some of these things. But I think it's really cool. So that remains a challenge, right? As we're putting BIM models together and 3D things, trying to make uh, the information more approachable, there's there's still nobody who wants to build off of the model, right? It's easier to build off 2D for a lot of reasons. And then a sheet of paper you can mark up. <laughs> so getting past drawings on a construction site, we actually don't have a killer technology yet that makes it better for most instances, right? So it's not that there's an aversion to tech, it goes back to, Nothing's really much better than 2D drawings, except the 3D drawing that's coordinated and pulls together the information to make sure that that 2D drawing is up to date and shows the conflicts and it's actually, um, you've got more information in it than it did before. But no, it's an exciting time and it's very hard to move things, right? It's very hard to convince people that, the, I, even that like using an iPad when you're hanging on a rig outside a building is somehow a good idea as opposed to using a um, waterproof paper and a grease pen, right? Like if it rains and you have an iPad, you're in trouble. So um, for now, I guess I would like to ask and throw it out to all three of you, whichever one wants to pick up, what technologies do you see that are being adopted today? in the next six months or in the next six years that you think are gonna have a have a significant impact on construction? One was the iPad that we've all been talking about and showing, right? That's actually been using, that many more people have been using it, which means the data is more organized when it comes in. Um, another is the laser scanning and drones and things, which were kind of kids' toys not that long ago, but now, now uh, it's kind of coarse, right? It's not every construction site likes to fly drones, but every site has a uh, survey that's tied to a, a total station that future surveys can be taken off of. It's like a small thing if you're not in the industry and a huge thing if you're in the industry to have surveys that are key to the same hard spot. Um, so the, the recording of information is getting more systematic. And then there's a lot of nice new products that kind of put that all together. So if you have all this sea of information and you wanna know where that detail in your drawing might be, the like Google image search of it so that you can find all the related documents and even check if that's the latest one. You know, I think that information and communication stuff is more important to the industry and will be, we'll change it going forward. I think that, you know, um, where we're going, like, we have a lot of improvements happening on our, our members and just the industry as a whole and digitizing. So I think you're going to see things like toolbox talks that are digitized more. I think you're going to see more going away from Excel and using real, what I call purpose built technologies. We're going in a good direction there. We're not using Excel to do project management or safety talks anymore. As we, as construction uses more purpose built technologies because they're more affordable. People are getting clarity to it. You're also seeing that they all tie together. There's a lot more integrations and 
the different technologies are talking to one another. So it is slowly becoming easier. But, um, you know, to, to answer your question, I do think that right now it's digitizing and using tools to capture data that's important for those businesses. And everyone is doing a better job. And I think a lot of the construction companies are figuring out what data do we need and how do we capture it uh, more than I've ever seen before. And I think we're heading in a good direction that way. Two that I might mention now. Well, one's been around for, for for a number of years, but it's just it's it's so cool that I and I, I just love talking about it is, is exoskeletons because the kind of it it adds it, it makes you become superhuman and in certain ways if you, if you think about it. And I just love them and I I love seeing them kind of develop out and giving people you know, the the safety protocols and the and the to be able to really facilitate a much better standard on site for over the corner of the, the next few years. You know, certainly the we'll call it here at the academic level and the, 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 where the study and research has gone and a lot of funding has gone into is very much on the digital and on-site fabrication. And with that 3D, 3D printing, to be able to print certain components and certain building parts and certain building materials on-site, um, which I think is gonna gain an awful lot of momentum over the next few years. And that, you know, those materials can be anything like maybe you know, cinder blocks, um, for an example. And what that will do is it'll really help and increase speed. And then of course, that other element that, you know, within the construction and the, the real estate element, which is uh, sustainability. It's gonna re help reduce low and lower emissions, you know, through the cut through, you know, far less delivery taking place to sites. So I think, you know, that's a, that's a much, a, very much a win-win situation as well. I, I think the other thing too, Jim, um, we're, you know, we do a lot on safety and I think, you know, something has changed in construction. It's not that, accidents are going to happen. I think that I think that kind of aura is gone. I think now with technology, the way we do things, I think every accident is preventable and technology can help us get to that place. But there's a mindset that's shifted in safety. And, you know, there's a, that's why I think you see so many safety technologies and different processes as far as digitizing safety. But um, I do see that changing and going in a good direction over the next six months too. Certainly, yeah. Uh, success story there, right? And the reduction of uh, accidents and problems in the uh, in ha in increase in people's uh, concern about safety. You know. Right. If I could jump in just for a supplemental question here and may start with Elizabeth and run down the group. Since we tried to focus on the six month window and there's a lot of technologies that, that could be implemented. If you could specify just one thing that comes to the top of your head that we should all be focused on in the next six months that you think is definitely something that'll be integrated. I think that that would be helpful because I know when we get into technology, it's so easy to think broad picture and all the things that could be, but if we can focus on one thing that you know is definitely something you see being integrated, I think that would, that would be helpful for all of us. There's, there's a set of, um of programs that, and there's different vendors for it, so I won't call it out a specific name, but when um, that, that coordinate the RFIs, the change orders, so request for information from the design team, change orders to the project, and then the work done in field. So just gets that data straight, um, that will likely be a huge advantage to whatever uh, site, you know, as the sites continue to implement it. Because this, instead of having to look back to see, hey, what happened at this location? I remember some guy took a photo once um, and finding that one thing that's important, it's uh, more organized, right? Like, and the Procores have some of it, but there's other technologies too that are, are beginning to put that information together and they're doing it right now, right? That's part of the acceleration with, maybe with COVID, right? With people getting used to using tech. And I have an example from my own home, although I didn't use the tech, but um, I have an apartment renovation going on and I kept taking photos, right? And it's a small apartment, so I could see where the photos are from on a large job site, it wouldn't have been that easy. And the contractor forgot to put the, the vanity in, in the bathroom. And I had the picture, you know, during, before demo, during demo, um, the where the old, inset was, you know, I could count bricks to see that there was enough space. So when he said there wasn't enough room to show him the series of photos and he could fix it. So being able to do that on a much larger scale of site, uh, which is what these technologies uh, allow is gonna make a, it's gonna make a big difference for 
you know, nothing ever goes quite right. So that'll help with that. And will also help hopefully um, make the communication better. Yeah, I, I, I think um, for me, when we get, a, and this is, been generally kind of brought about by the pandemic wearables have become a huge element of the construction tile as well um, originally you know a lot of the teams and a lot of the development was done on a proximity basis to allow you know to so there was no close contacts on site but they've you know a lot of people have realized that this has you know multiple applications specifically safety and where that kind of is going is not necessarily a wearable that a lot of people want to put on their hat or they want to put on their safety belt or in their boots but we're trying to we're seeing an awful lot of companies trying to implement it with into apps on phones which makes it a little bit easier for people to you know not forget their particular you know that particular technology and where that comes from and then you know so you what you get to find out is where people are on site where they're you know are they in the areas that they're supposed to be so you can measure productivity levels but also that that element that we that talked about earlier, which is safety. You can figure out where if people have fallen off a ladder, if people have kind of fallen down a duct or something along those lines. And because of that, that's a very, um, how will I put it? It's a very simple idea and concept, but it is immersing itself in a massive way. I, I, we're certainly seeing across a number of sites over the last six months. I think it's gonna to continue to, get, to, to go that way. So picking up on that, and you go ahead, Matt. I, was gonna say, I, I saw there was a question uh, about digitizing safety, and I wanted to just address that. I think, you know, um, you know, the, I look at it the simplest form in uh, when you're digitizing safety, um, just you know, making it paperless. Um, so I, I kind of think of paperless safety documentation. So looking at how do we how do we put safety inspections into a purpose built technology, which th there's many. Um, you've got companies like EMOD or SafeSite that are easy to use, but they're purpose-built. They're not meant, they're not like Excel. They're meant to actually track safety, looking at things like hazard management, safety observations, incident reporting, it, and those things help you plan ahead. You now have historical data you can look at, but if you digitize that process in a way that is built for actually say, you know, safety monitoring and tracking, you can predict for the future, you can showcase how safe you've been. And, you know, in some cases you can even grade how you've done, but that's kind of what, at least what I meant um, by that question. And Jim, to answer um, kind of the question that you put out, one thing on safety that is an unknown statistic is that there's a lot of focus on job site safety, but the truth is in construction, five times as many people die from suicide off of job sites than actual job site fatalities. So you have, so, you know, now as an association, we don't look at just safety, we look at safety and total human health. And those are lagging indicators. So those numbers are still about a year old, but um, that's why you have different groups popping up. And this is not a technology thing. I'm just, when you look at the next six months and look at safety, I think it's just something to just realize and understand is that there's a bigger issue than safety just happening on the job sites, but just as, you know, in construction as a whole. Um, Can I just ask a quick question? Is that is that people who are coming to the site and like going up the top of the building? Is that construction workers on the site themselves? That's off the that's off the site. So basically, focusing on everything in between the hard hat and the goggles. You know, the individual itself. Um, but people who are off of job sites, there and there could be there. There's a lot of issues. Not to go on a rabbit hole with it, but um, there's a lot of construction professionals who are not on job sites, but off of job sites. Uh, committing suicide for different reasons and it goes under not job site safety but just total human health on what's happening behind the hard hat with these individuals in construction um we are you know we're putting a lot of efforts towards it we collaborate with there's one group called ciasp um that does a lot of work on it it's the construction industry and alliance for suicide prevention but um that is i think something that's kind of lost sometimes in in safety and construction that's a good point, Matt. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, so sort of getting into uh, picking up what I think where the panel went, um, you know, we've talked about technology and its growth and its, its impact and its benefit. Um, but I'll tell you, as a uh, construction attorney who litigates construction disputes, who goes to the site after there's a problem, there is a massive amount of data out there that people need to go through. Um, and there's a lot of concerns about all of the 
ability to track workers, to track what they do, to track the work itself. Um, just I'll pick on you, James. Should, uh, should we be concerned about this? Are we okay? Are there, uh, you know, do the benefits outweigh the, uh, the concerns about the abundance of data and the tracking. Well, you're, now, you're, 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 you're now getting into that whole <laughs> whole element of privacy. And, you know, as, as that's a whole different department, even in your law firm, you know, that deals with that. So, you know, throwing that one at me is a, is a nice one. But it's, you know, that it's a fundamental question that comes into this all the time. And we have to deal with this in a number of other aspects. The question is, do you utilize personal private data in order to facilitate greater productivity or is there a line at which you kind of shouldn't cross because you're 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 going into you know you, it's personal data that really shouldn't be available to people but in the greater good you know is that extra productivity worth kind of you know looking into somebody's private lives or what they're actually doing um it's a, it's a it's not a question that we're going to be able to answer on this particular call because there's there's more debate on this you know what I mean even you know, at a at a political level than there is anywhere else and this is across the globe. For me, you know, the privacy is something that's and, and uh, with data is something that people should be educated on as much as anything else, and that's kind of the important part. As long as people know what they're signing up for when they sign when they when they're starting to use a system and implement the system. And that, you know, their personal number as to, like, let's say with wearables, where they're going and what they're actually doing is going to be recorded from here on in. You know, is that worth the extra level of safety that comes with that? For me, yes. But a lot of people might not necessarily agree with that. Um, the important thing is, what I was going back to, is that people should be educated with that. And what you have to do is you have to allow each individual to opt in to that. And, and allow them to, to understand what their data is doing. The, the issue, of course, is that when people do that, they get a 27-page legal document that someone has written in your office that you can go to the bottom and you say, opt in, and they don't necessarily know what that is. And that's, that, that can be a little bit unfair as well. But, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very hard and difficult topic to kind of get to. But for me, productivity is an area that definitely has huge debate. Safety there's no debate. If something, allow, you know what I mean, is ensuring the safety of the, and well-being of the people on site, I don't think there's, you know, there's much of an argument on that. When it comes to productivity, that's that's a much, much harder element to kind of get in behind. And there's there's an awful lot to assess there. And I, I, I'll only get given out to if I have a real opinion on it. You made, you made a good point, James. It's, um, I, I think people don't understand or realize what is what is invasive and what's not. Um, I think, for example, when someone is given a card, um, when someone's given a card to go to a job site that shows that they have certain certifications, that they're safe to go on the job site and secured, but that tracks that they're in the perimeter of a job site, it's not tracking when you go to the bathroom. It's not tracking you know, to this very granular level, but I think some workers don't realize that. And sometimes, and this goes to many technologies, there's just a lack of education on what it's doing and you know why it's a value, not that it's trying to be big brother all the time. But there's just communication I've seen on why that doesn't happen seamlessly sometimes. So this may maybe even relate to the idea that the construction industry um, is slower, right? Because um, there are agreements with labor and others that restrict how much information you can take. So if you go on a job site, um, there isn't a camera in many job sites, a camera that's watching what people are doing, right? They might be overview uh, kind of shots of the progression of the construction, but they won't be on the level of folks working. If you walk into a store to go shopping and you buy something from the shelf, there is a camera that is watching you. And there is data that's taken like at the checkout when you buy something and that information is, is available, right? And it shows the productivity of the store and what you're gonna put on the shelf. So it's really interesting, I think, what, what people are okay with with data in different settings. Um, and to kind of flip the technology thing on and the innovation thing on its head, um, I think the constraints are gonna be fine, right? There's enough push and pull in the industry that if, if every job site runs like a job site where, where um, 
uh, the laborers have equal power, then it'll come to an answer that that works, right? Because you, you kind of want to know when the big pieces are coming in, whether or not the steel's been erected, whether or not everything's in the right place, uh, more than you want to know all the detail. Because then, yes, when <laughs> Jim and I get there later, when something's gone wrong, if you have every little thing, you're going to miss what's important. And so trying to keep the data that's important, which includes if there's a safety incident, but you don't only need it for, you know, a short period of time, right? If everybody's okay after the week, then you don't necessarily need to keep all that granular information for a long time, where there's other stuff that's um, important to the progress or important to understanding shipping delays or something you haven't thought of, um, where keeping that, that granular data is important. Um, but it is interesting, right? Like what, what I'll do personally, what this watch knows about me is more than what a, what um, might be okay in a job setting. Right? Interesting where we sit. Elizabeth, um, I just kind of, to use kind of two of the examples that you, you alluded to earlier on, if you were to merge the two concepts going forward. So, you know, a camera who could, which can, you know, and you use the, you know, the picture of, of, of your, of your, um, uh, your, your vanity mirror, but like, I mean, if we were to utilize z z drones going forward on the construction site and then add camera to it as well with you know AI and machine learning capabilities that could understand exactly what particular labor did what amount of work over a particular piece of time. That's kind of getting into the productivity levels is where I was kind of looking at this. That's, that's, that causes great debate. That's where there's a lot of friction. Do people want that? Do want people, you know, obviously as the owner of a construction firm, would I love to be able to assess that? I think I would. I would love to have that information. Who are the people who can, you know, achieve the greatest success on the ground for, you know, and drive the business forward? But as an individual, would I want that been looked at in that sort of really strong granular level? Not to cause trouble, but if you're yeah. buying something at Amazon, right? It yeah. won't have looked just yeah. at what you're buying. It will have looked at everything else you're shopping for. And if you like get a coupon thing, then it'll see where you're coming from and where you're going to, right? And if you're in a supermarket and there's a camera, then with AI, you could see, for example, that you were browsing one other shelf first before you got to the shelf where you bought the thing, which is, is just to say, you know, what being out in public means and what it means to be on a construction site and our contract with one another on what information is okay to take. Um, it'll be interesting going forward because you're right in a sort of calculation kind of way, you could predict how fast the construction completes with more surety if, if this information could be used. I wanted to switch to something very related, I think also on the issue of a plethora of technology, if you will. And I see there's a question here um, to Elizabeth. And I think that's probably a good way to get into the topic. I wanted to talk about, all right, you have all of these various systems out there, are they talking to one another, but Jim Casella posed the question to Elizabeth, your, your point about technology handling RFIs and change orders. As a subcontractor, we struggle that every GC or job site has their own software for this. So we are forced to learn and work in several systems. Do you see any standardization on the horizon? And I was gonna say, I've seen you know, job sites where various people have separate Procore databases. Primavera doesn't talk to Procore, that doesn't talk to uh, Excel, that doesn't talk to anything else. So you got everything out there, but um, what, are you, what are your thoughts? And Elizabeth sent some questions to you. I'm gonna ask you to please pick up on that. So, so one is we're in the interoperability. Okay. Interoperability. Yeah. One um one is we're in the same boat, right? Uh, engineers never get to pick what software is used, um, which is how our internal innovation started. Is we started writing translators between the different modeling programs that the different architects and the different owners were requiring out of us, um, and so I'm sure that that kind of coding if, you, if you've got the skill for it or the resources for it really, um, will continue to, to work on you know, your own in-house brew that makes everything more interoperable. Um, 
The other thing though is, is that, you know, in the end we're, we're still doing the construction work. So there's nothing in any of these systems that should stop the sheet of paper from being print, printed out and handed to somebody, you know, kind of like worst case or couriered over, I guess, worst case. There's nothing about the technology that stops, um, should stop that boundary of the, the digital divide boundary from working because in the end it's a sheet of paper in a job site. So it's like, um, when we just started having um, having computers for, for going on, on flights, right? Everybody had a different system. And if the computer was down then the person at the counter would put your information in a book and like, it wouldn't be the end of the day. You just, they'd write it down and you'd move on with life. Same thing as like a cash register at a small store. Um, I'm not sure that the construction industry gets to say at some point that, you know, the internet's down, therefore I can't. Like, I'm not sure as a group of folks, we're okay with that. Um, I, I kind of hope not, uh, which means um, if you can't show your sub the RFI because they're not in the system, then, you know, fix it, right? But yeah, it's gonna, there's gonna be a lot of different things until, until one or two win and we're kind of in the middle of it. So is that, is that happening? Are there systems that are integrating they're taking on all the different functions the accounting the data you know the database the the scheduling there are many that promise to do it right there's like a pitch a day about a new system that'll integrate everything um and so it's interesting so there's apis um programming application programming interfaces where you can connect to many of these to procore even to primavera if you're in the mood for that kind of headache, um, where you can get information in and out without, and then and then pull it into a third thing. So there's there's stuff that exists, um, but everything's kind of changing around it. So I don't know. I think for a little while it's going to be a, um, it's still going to be a few different things that people like best. Um, like Procore is what a lot of folks have now, but it's not that old. Um, New Forma came and went. It kind of felt like. Um, there's plan grid, which is fantastic, but then auto, Autodesk spot it. So who knows how long it'll be easy to use um, without, you know, <laughs> being too uh, biased about saying it. So there's a lot of these softwares that are, you know, yes, there's going to be a lot of different things to try for a while, but it's not different than other stuff, right? There were a lot of different favorite, like Bosch had a better screwdriver than somebody else for a moment, right? Um, and Microsoft, whether or not Microsoft. the tools work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, well, Elizabeth, can I ask you a quick question on that? Because I always use the, the sorry for you jumping in with, with Microsoft, but I always use that as the, you know, the <laughs> premium example of, with all of this when you have some sort of consolidation within a marketplace. But how do you see that playing out? Like, do you think it will be the likes of one of the ones that you mentioned just establishing itself as the market leader and adding on? more and more functionality over the course of time? Or will it be a case like we had more in the, you know, say in the property management spheres over the last couple of years in real estate tech, where you had maybe a number of people come in with huge private equity capital behind them and just bought up anything that was necessary and tried to merge it into their platform? Which, do, how do you think it will play out? Or, or is there a better way for the, the industry for it to play out? If I, did, if I knew the answer, I wouldn't have to be an engineer, right? I would invest yeah. in that and then move on. Um, but I know I kind of hope that it continues to have things that pop up that are are better and different and and address things in a different way. So I really do like the um, like an API settling a little bit so that things are more work together better. Like that's the sort of standardization that the that maps have on geocode so that everybody can have a different kind of map, but all the maps work together. And then like, if you're driving your car, the GPS works with other things. There's ways to standardize, which the industry isn't anywhere near, but um, there's the two kinds, right? There's a McDonald's standardization. And then there's the, um, the every Chinese restaurant you go into has the same menu. So there's a standardization because uh, Microsoft or somebody takes over and says, this is the way that it's gonna be. And then there's just this expectation that whenever you go into Chinese restaurant, it's going to have General Tso's chicken and uh, egg roll and like things that are not at all Chinese, doesn't matter. Um, and they're different by the way, in every country, but they're also 
standardized, right? You, you know what you expect when you walk in and it would be, I, I don't know, I kind of hope that construction software is more like the Chinese restaurant and less like McDonald's because I think it lends for the kind of continuing innovation and change that the industry has. Um, but that's my best guess. I mean, I do think what one thing you're seeing is with all the integrations going on, and I think it's more the Chinese menu, it, it, but it's becoming such a part with, you know, all the money going into new, new tech companies. Uh, companies are actually being built that just do the integration part of it. Like Rivet, if you know who they are, like they're a company that just takes small growing businesses and connects and integrates them with the Procores and the Autodesks. And, you know, there, there's some others in there, but um, I don't see that changing. In fact, I, I would see more competitors coming to Rivet side because so many of the new companies coming in want to integrate and they don't want to buy developer teams just to do the integration part of it. So I do think you're, we're going this direction where more is going to be integrated. No one is trying to take down everything on their own. That, that is just, I just don't see that being the case anymore. So. Right. Anyway. Just to add on that, if I could, Matt, if you could, uh, from your perspective, how do we encourage contractors and subcontractors to use these systems? Because I know from some of the developer clients that I have, their frustration is we've got, we actually paid for the software. We paid for an opportunity for all of us to integrate what you're doing on the job site, but we can't convince our subs and our subcontractors to actually use it. They don't actually go in and input the data. What would you suggest is, is a way to try to encourage that? I think the, the biggest challenge we have is, um, you know, technology is not being utilized mostly because of poor adoption. And I think that goes to just constant education um, to, to those groups who are implementing the tech. Why are you, why are you using it? Um, one of the issues we, that we're seeing is the bigger contractors are buying everything under the sun. So um, they're not using anything all that well um, or to, you know, that they're sticking with. But I think it just could, you know, from what I'm seeing, it's just educating properly on how to do it and getting everyone on the same page. It seems like you're always going to have, in some cases, a rogue agent, if you will, who wants to do things the way he's done it for 30 years. But it, it, part of it is culture, part of it's education, but you've got to get everybody on the same page. And there's not a, a perfect answer. I think every contractor is dealing with this, and at least most of them that I've seen, there's nothing is perfect, but the more education, and the more showing of why the technology is helpful for everybody and beneficial, um, the better. And I don't know if that answers your question, but I, I but like that's that's where we are at right now. And yep. we need more companies to embrace a culture that is, uh, you know, bringing innovation, education, adoption, and uh, look, technology and implementing and adopting these things is hard. I think we forget sometimes to celebrate the fact that we've used something new, even if it's small. We just don't celebrate those small successes sometimes. So, Lewis, I, Lewis, I might just add to that. It's a little bit, it's a very difficult situation when you're dealing with subcontractors, subcontractors who are not part of your team. Yes. But when it comes to a situation where you, like, especially when it comes to data input, which is a very important part, let's say within the brokerage community as much as anything else, they've done, they've, what they've done is they've looked to your profession as to seeing how it actually, how did, how did the legal world do it? Because you, you led the way on this when it came to data input with time management, which completely changed over the last few years. And unfortunately, it was more of a stick than it was a carrot in that if the person didn't input their data, then they got a, they, I mean, they got a yellow card as such and they were acknowledged. And then second time around, you know, I mean, it, it led to a greater uh, evolution of issue, if that, okay, if one might put it, you know, be it a fine or you restrict you know, money going down the chain and, and brokerage are looking at doing that as well. I mean, in order to get an awful lot of these technologies to work, it's all about the data input at, the, at, the, at certainly at the bottom level or at the foundation level. And it might be a case that you might, you might need to structure conversations and deals with people within the industry that, you know, we need you to, to come on board with what we have as well to make this all work. And you, you, we, as part of that situation, you have to agree to input this data. And if you don't, then we, we, you know, you don't get paid the full amount at the, at the, at the end of the day. And I, I hate going down that path of adoption, but unfortunately, some of the most successful stories in that have had to include more of a, 
a, a stick element than the carrot, you know, as, as much as anything. And it's just an, it's an interesting way to look at it. Sorry, I know I've opened this up to a can of worms of a huge argument, so I apologize for that, but just. I, I like it when it gets to the point where it's frictionless, right? So, I mean, yep. every, like my, my kids play with their computer devices. Nobody has to tell them, like, you no, know, you need to use your iPad more. So it's, it's not like, a, <laughs> not like a, a, a problem when it's um, easy, right? And so a lot of these things aren't easy yet. Um, and, but they have the potential to be easier. Um, and then there's a whole set of really interesting things that are like support for doing one's work. So like um, if it could teach you how to, they use this more for manufacturing now, but there's no reason it couldn't be in construction where you're trained how to do uh, your job, right? Whatever assembly you're doing, you're trained with a kind of headset AR, VR kind of thing. And then, um, and then that's the thing that, you know, a similar system that you've now gotten used to that, that lets you log your information. Um, so that combination of how you do your job and helping you be a master at that um, and that that's tied into how you share the information about the progress of things. It's like, it seems really exciting to me. So yeah, it's, sometimes you tell people they have to do their timesheets, but, um, but in between there, the, there's gotta be like, cool automatic stuff or just fun stuff that like the gamification of things hasn't made it too much to construction yeah. yet but I, I, I love cool. i love the gamification like me you know, I'm, I'm i'm all about that it's just it's much much harder when you hit a certain forgive me say a certain individual over a certain age it can be much much harder for them to accept adoption and, and deal with certain changes with with it within their their day-to-day -day. I mean, a lot of a lot of contractors have started to implement uh, dual education. So essentially, the new the new workers coming in, they're learning from the you know from the veterans and the trades on everything about the trades and how to be a good builder. But the young guy, you know, the young group is teaching them about technology, and it's not a perfect science, but it is working. And I know, like locally in Chicago, Pepper Construction does that, for example. But it's um, yeah, I mean, we even when you know, I think you know, you hit on this a little bit, Elizabeth is like. The future generations working in the education front. We're not we're not doing enough on technology education. So, you know, the the workforce development piece of this, I think we have some work to do. Um, you know, I'm bringing incorporating both technology and innovation to the way we build because right now um, we're still doing mostly the same workforce development we did, we we did years ago. But we've got a changing workforce and we're catering to a whole different person that is demanding safer more innovative ways that we built otherwise they're going to go somewhere else so yeah different okay. area thank you so i have a i have a related question to that it's the other side of it i suppose so what are what are some practical obstacles that that we might be able to identify that are facing the construction industry now to adopting some of these advances in technology. I think we've hit on some, but anybody want to take a shot at trying to identify some of those obstacles? In the interest of just listing what we've gone through so far, right? This interoperability thing that you're buying and investing and training folks on something which then the next site doesn't need um, that's that's a problem, right? So we do have to address one way or another. You have to go expect what you get when you walk into the restaurant, regardless what kind of restaurant it is. Um, the the training thing and and the different generations for it. Uh, I don't have a good answer to that. Um, um, for me, some of the um, probably regulation as much as anything else as well. And that comes into it in two kind of facets. One is, you know, we're seeing an awful lot of advances with building materials, certainly here, you know, where I'm based and the, what can be done with that. But it takes a long, an, awful, an awful long time for them to implement themselves down onto to ground level, you know, at, at a very practical level. But going back to kind of one of the earlier description or one of the earlier things we talked about, which is drones. The drones, you know, four or five years ago, they were seen as this fantastic new technology. Um, but over the course of a number of years with different issues and uh, they, they caused an awful lot of mayhem on a lot of construction sites as well. 
they, they, they didn't work necessarily, as, but, and they're starting to really kind of come back into the fore because the new technological advances. But trying to ensure that there are certain protocols in place and regulations in place to ensure that they are safely used and that no, no one gets hurt from these things and then utilized for the exact reason then that they were, they were designed for. This is on the drones, it's interesting because the excitement and the regulation weren't lined up with one another. So you can now survey the exterior of a building with drones in Chicago, even in New York. Um, you can send the photos to an AI that tracks your damage, like it's all cool stuff, but it's years after people were playing with it. So now, now that it's kind of like old hat, that's when the regulations have caught up to it. Yeah. Not just the regulations, right? Also the drones themselves, they've got different limit, limiters on them so you couldn't by mistake fly them into an airplane or, or cause you know disproportionate trouble with them. But, um, but yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting thing. And the regulations on the use of drones is going to change from one area and one state to another. You might have a, a construction manager on a project site in Wisconsin who is thinking about using a drone and but then is concerned about if it's legal in that specific state county. And Jim, one thing I, I would add to, you know, it, it's um, just one way to look at it uh, from the question you posed is I think looking at because this happens all the time, what, what decisions are you making without data? And then, you know, looking back at, okay, what, what data would have helped me make this decision just better and easier? Because then you're, you're working backwards and then you can be like, okay, this technology can help me gather some of that data. But I still, we're not making enough data, data driven decisions in construction right now. And a lot of the technology is allowing us to gather data easier and more seamlessly than before. So Matt, what kind of data-driven decisions would we or should we be making? I mean, you know, there's, uh, you know, for example, there is really low cost, easy, you know, easy to use technology that'll help you understand um, what labor certifications minorities are on your job site and making sure they're all certified. Just to get that data would be really interesting. If you're trying to show that you have a, a diverse workforce, that's a really easy way to do it and try and have that data in real time. Um, but it's, it's simple as that. Now you can take that in a million different directions, but that's just one example um, of doing that. Um, again, safety, what, where should you focus your safety efforts? Well, if you start doing, you know, tracking some of the things I mentioned earlier, you can take a look at that and be like, okay, well, we had an incident in this area and we were lagging here. You can look at historical data and maybe see why, uh, certain instances have happened or things you can do to improve it. But um, I don't know, that, that's just a couple examples, but I think it, again, just goes back to, you can be more productive um, if you, if there's certain sets of data that you, that you have and recognize. And, you know, as James talked about there, there, there is friction with some of that, but I think everyone, or in most cases, um, there's an opportunity to gather more data that can be useful to help you be productive and a little safer. It, yeah, and on a job site, you know, when there's been a problem, we're going to have to, we're going to be gathering data and some of that's going to be helpful. We might have a judge or an arbitrator who's going to insist on us having proof of uh, exactly who did what, where to repair some problem in order for us to be able to recover that uh, cost. And so if we've got data there, that's going to be helpful. Well, I think Elizabeth pointed this out earlier. You also don't want to you know, have a have a situation where the data you need to find is stuck on Vinny's phone, um, you know, or someone someone's phone, and uh, you know because you didn't you didn't have everything, you didn't have your data that was managed and easy to find and easy to use, um, because that's going to open a whole new slew of issues that's going to waste everyone's time. But you don't want um, I don't know. You don't want a case decided by the fact that you got someone's cell phone just in time with the picture and you need it. So um, I know we talked earlier about photo documentation, but that, um, you know, I think there's a lot of ways to do that, you know, um, in, in many cases, not for that big of a cost. That's a good point. So I can pitch a uh, forthcoming ABA chapter on electronically sourced information and in construction, um, because it's going to be important how 
afterwards how all this data is asked for, right? Because if you if we get it the way that we sometimes get things, which is printed out to PDF with all the metadata gone, um, it, the amount of information connect, collected now at a job site would, could make it infeasible to find anything. But um, if the data comes with the systems that, that collected it and made it um, accessible during construction, then, then it might mean that the amount of time taken to figure out what happened is, is reduced, right? That it reduces the cost of claims because you can get to what the, the center part of the argument is much faster instead of going through the many banker boxes of information. But like it, it this, the side effect of the construction on what happens when something goes wrong um, is also still evolving and will be really interesting. You could have somebody take a photo of a, of a task that's been completed in the field as part of HQ documentation and the metadata attached to the photo says that the photo was taken somewhere totally different on the site. Exactly. That kind of thing could happen. I wanna uh, pose at least one more question here and then we could go to a couple of questions that are on in the Q&A. Um, what new construction materials are you seeing or anticipating that you will be seeing uh, that will be important to the industry? So one um, is just concrete and greener concrete. So a lot, a lot of um, innovation is going into how to make concrete uh, not be a source of carbon, but a sink for it. And then how to have enough material, right? The Portland cement isn't gonna last forever to have enough material to keep, uh, keep going with our construction. Um, but it's, there, a lot of concrete is used. So it's, it's not the sexiest of materials maybe. Um, but it is uh, really important, right? It's, it's housed much of the world. And um, if we get it right, so that is find a concrete that is even just a bit greener, um, that um, is sustainably, so that where its material is sustainable, um, not even in a green sort of way, where there's just enough of it, um, that it that it that it change the world, right? If there was less um, concrete failure, spalling, that kind of stuff, um, that's also really important for, for how we all live. Um, then there's the usual stuff, still gets stronger and more green itself. Um, everything kind of gets stronger. And in addition to the carbon fiber kind of, I, I really look forward to when carbon rods are gonna be in concrete and not, not steel, so we don't have rust anymore. Um, but um, those are my thoughts. <laughs> and since you opened the box, Unless you had something you were going to say, Matt, did I jump into? I was going to say, I, I agree with everything she said. When you start looking even further down the road, that's where that types of materials plays a role in 3D printing. And even though we're in its infancy, 3D printing is only going to grow in scale um, and not just residential, but on the commercial side. We're seeing it happen, you know, small pieces now, but, um, you know, that really all goes back to, you know, materials and coming from concrete. Jim, I'll, I may as well pitch the uh, the crazy stuff here and futuristic stuff at MIT, which is, you know, for me, one of the, the cool stuff is, is like transparent aluminum. And if, you know, if anyone who's a, a Star Trek fan, Star Trek 4, you know, when they when they came to Earth, this was the, the material that they do, tried to, well, had they created the, the huge aquarium for the whales when they, when they left Earth. And this is now a product that's actually been developed here and people are trying to, you know, immerse it into building design over the next few years. And then another one of, of you know just very crazy futuristic levels is um, robotic swarm construction. Can you if you can imagine that if, if you've ever seen the end of the Matrix, all of these little robots that work in sync like termites together, that would be able to you know it, as they exactly like termites would work in sync to be able to to build anything that could be you know orchestrated or designed from them. They would have sensors to be able to detect the presence of each other and rules for getting around and getting you know getting in and out each other's ways and this has actually been designed by a team up in uh, up, up in harvard over the last couple of years and it's something to, to kind of take note from because it's very very cool stuff thank you so uh i think um elizabeth touched on sustainability um and, uh, james since you're talking about the future i'll ask you uh, sustainability and lead 
building certification is seems to be becoming more important. Is that going to be aided by technology, or are there going to be uh, is that going to be something that drives the adoption of technology? Do you think? Absolutely. Um, ESG policy has become the, you know, at the forefront of of every real estate developer, owner, operator, and construction team across the globe in the in the last number of years, and how you know be it through regulation or through their own initiative of wanting to make change, the, the biggest way that they can initiate that is through the implementation and adoption of new technologies. Uh, there are a number of them out there and, and, and you know, which ones are the, the ones that can make the biggest difference? That's again, up for debate. Um, I, I continue to you know, sing, sing for a digital twin as being the technology that will really orchestrate and facilitate this at, at a much higher level. Um, a digital twin is a, a virtual representation of the building itself, a little bit along the lines of a BIM model, but it's the next level stage where you then on top of the virtual representation, you add in layers and layers of past and present data to be able to understand what's taking place in the building at that moment in time. And then from that, what you can do is you can create forecasting scenarios and model certain scenarios from that to understand which materials, which uh, particular technologies and, and how you actually use the space and what can actually take place, you know, gone, I've, I've missed a step there, but, you know, it's very hard to experiment once you build a building in order to make and to create change. So this, what this would allow you to do is to run those scenarios to actually make those changes and see how they would actually pan out and, and, and work from there. And that's a technology that I think can really facilitate the, the, um, this new level of sustainability that we're looking at across the globe. Okay. There's a couple other for sustainability, if you don't mind. One is, um, I think, bespoke uh, bespoke design criteria. So carbon carbon content of a building is something one can calculate and design for in a way that you haven't before. We haven't before. And flood levels are set by insurance companies or set by ASC seven, but they're not necessarily up to date to different. You know the the full possibility of changes, right? The specific changes in your area. If somebody builds a parking lot, then that'll overload your culvert kind of specific local changes. So bespoke um, design criteria needs more technology, which we're close to having. Um, it lets you design maybe even like the impact on foot traffic in around your building kind of stuff, in addition to what we usually design for. Um, uh, so yeah, that should help with sustainability if we identify how to how to be more sustainable and then design for it. Okay, that's really interesting. Appreciate that. Um, Lewis, we might have a couple questions. Do you wanna throw those out? You're on mute. I was muted. Uh, I have a specific question for uh, Elizabeth. Uh, here in South Florida, um, in, I'm sure you, you're aware of it, uh, the, the Surfside building that collapsed um, last year and uh, created a, 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 in, a bigger interest in engineering and, 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 and how we can, can be more specific on, on our processes and engineering buildings here in Florida so that it doesn't happen again. Uh, I was wondering if, if you, had, first of all, if you're aware of it, and then second, what, what specific technologies could be implemented in either construction or the actual uh, maintenance of an existing building to help track things such as uh, changes in soil compaction, um, uh, salinization intrusion, spalling, or uh, differences in tensile strength or, or, or um, uh, concrete structural integrity so that people can better track uh, what is going on with, with a building in, in, I guess, more or less in real time to try and prevent that from happening for future buildings. Um, yes, uh, without specifics, because I really don't know, I don't think anybody knows specifics. Um, the interest in people's, the robustness of everybody's structure in Florida and elsewhere um, increased considerably. And we all had to think about all of, 
all engineers, right, had to think what we, we might be doing differently now than we would have done in a building assessment, you know, the week before, the month before. Um, building assessments so far are visual. You look to see um, if there's any pattern of cracks or deformation that are a sign of, of significant displacement if you're looking for something imminent or uh, you look at um, signs of degradation, how the building might have lost strength over time. Um, usually buildings are really boring. That is very little happens to them. Um, you can see kind of the worst they could be when you go into a parking garage because then the spalling and the, and the rust are, um, you know, at the levels that are most evident to, to folks walking through. Um, there are differences though on different, how different municipalities uh, look at buildings, what they require before they're turned over to another owner, what they're um, required to, in, in a kind of stewardship way, what they're required to file. Um, and that, that's worth looking at, right? Different places have different requirements and they could help, uh, um, well, not, let's not talk about the specific example, if you don't mind, but we, if you are generally on a condo board or a co-op board or what, whatever your um, area has and you've had repairs to do, um, then it would help if you were required to by some regulation, but it would also cost money, right? The extreme of this is California after Northridge where many buildings um, had to be uh, retrofit or demolished, right? So it had a huge impact on the amount of available buildings when you kind of overdo a change or, or reasonably do a change, right? Or aware of something new and, um, and um, scary. Um, that being said, technology, if we knew more about how, how things are constructed, <laughs> right? Really, how they really are built, where everything ended up, then theoretically, like in a future where all that data is available, one could go back and say, oh, this is a new thing I didn't know before. And then just go through and check all that old stuff to see if there's something that needs a retrofit or uh, you know, be more targeted on, on what one's looking for. Um, there are uh, definitely ways to see how much chlorine is in concrete and definitely uh, really straightforward ways to see whether or not the rebar is increased and is corroding. So a lot of a lot of what one does to make sure things are, are robust and standing are, um, are well described. And you see them more often on bridges because bridges are just exposed to the um, environment more often and have fatigue on them as well, right? Because truckloads bounce things around. Um, so from the test case of our infrastructure, there's a lot that, that we all know without too much technological change. But if we could look backwards and, and see you know, the, how this new thing that we may have learned affects all the old stuff that's built and to target uh, fixes, that would be fantastic, right? <laughs> that would make all of us feel better. Yeah, Elizabeth, I just might jump in there. And, you know, a couple of things that have been developed here at the minute, specifically, I mean, in relation to this, one is kind of an evolution of carbon nanotubes, which is, you know, and nanoscale sensors, which could potentially, what would happen is they would be embedded into the building materials itself, like metal, concrete, wood, or glass, and then potentially installed to monitor the stresses inside the building itself and identify potential fractures or cracks, you know, before they occur. And then I know that we have another couple of other studies going on with them. I'm going to butcher the name here: aramid fibers. You know, I mean, in the retrofitting of, of building, you know what I mean, in order to Definitely. facilitate and, and strengthen the uh, the um, and reinforce the the older concrete structures that are going on, you know, from you know a bygone era or from, from a different time. But you mentioned something else I, and I'm gonna throw it in there as well is it was a great idea. And so people I know that are, are really looking at it at the minute is to create, we don't often find uses for this technology just yet in construction, but blockchain technology. And that is to bring together all of the data points when a, when a building is constructed, that way we would have a digital incorruptible passport of understanding exactly how the building was made at a particular moment in time, what was put into it, with all of the materials and the and the techniques so that we could go back you know in a number of years time that if there was issues discovered within that building or how things were used that they could be fixed and there would be a true record of what really took place which is like is a, a really really great idea i've just seen the companies who are talking about blockchain it's been more of a marketing tool than actually oh. applying blockchain to construction and i absolutely look i think we're i i think it's my hope is that's where we go. I just, uh, 
you know, I, I think it has the applications make so much sense as you were talking about. I just unfortunately have seen people use it as a marketing tool than an actual application at this point. Well, um, folks, I, I got to tell you, this has been um, this has been very educational for me and enjoyable. Uh, I want to uh, I want to thank uh, all of our panelists again, and I appreciate being here with with all of you and with Lewis. And so we're going to conclude our, our webinar. Um, don't forget to keep an eye out for a follow-up email, which is going to include a link to a recording and <clears throat> that all-important CLE survey. And also, um, if you had questions, we didn't get to them, we'll try to follow up. So thanks, everyone, for being here, and special thanks to the panel. Everybody have a great day.